even at a certain point, um, I was so fatigued with playing bars um, that I, I took a job pushing a broom in an electronics store uh, and uh, said that I wasn't going to play another paying gig uh, until I got a record or a tour. And uh, within 30 days, uh, I got both. And uh, yeah, you got a record. So you did you did a record played on an album and uh got hired as a session musician yeah and yeah. i ended up uh, on tour with joe cocker right there at that same time but it, it it was always um straight gigs and bar gigs and straight gigs and bar gigs and then finally i got sick of the bars and just did the straight gig and then uh somehow or another the the momentum shifted and i ended up uh with joe cocker I ended up touring and playing on people's records. Well, um, I did have some questions about the Joe Cocker gigs, sure. but I I have heard you tell the story of how you got the gig with Joe Cocker, and you know I, I figured even though you've told it elsewhere, it would be nice to touch on because it's such a fascinating story. No, oh, um, could you could you go over it a little bit? Well, I was a huge fan, always had been, and uh, as I was making friends in New York City during that same time period, we're talking about. Um, I was in a band, we played in, in a lot of bars in the area with uh, Lester Chambers from the Chambers Brothers and Harvey Brooks, um, the famous bass player, a bunch of other guys, one of whom was a keyboard player named Jeff Levine. I was playing trumpet in the band. And uh, Jeff was kind of a mentor with me because he was pretty far up the food chain uh, as one of the New York City players go, and in particular in uh, R&B and soul music. He was a fabulous, fabulous B3 player. And he ended up Joe Cocker's uh, musical director for quite some time through various different incarnations of Joe Cocker bands. And uh, he called me and said, uh, we're rehearsing in town. Would you like to come watch rehearsal? And I said, yeah, absolutely. Uh, him knowing what a big fan I was. So I went to the rehearsal studio and uh, watched the band rehearse. And uh, it was thrilling. I loved it. It was really fun. They took a break. And uh, Jeff was sitting in a real grand piano. Um, and everybody left the room, or at least so we thought. And he uh, said, what did you think? I came, sat down next to him on the bench. And I said, it was, it's amazing. I Thank you. Incredible. He goes, no, what did you think of the keyboard playing? And uh, I was like, are you kidding, man? You're killing it, crushing it. Um, except for Hitchcock Railway. That was a tune that was on one of the early Joe Cocker records, and it had a piano introduction to it. And he says, what do you mean? And I said, well, it's not quite exactly the way you're you're playing it. And he said, well, play it. And I was like, you know, reluctant. And uh, I'll show you some other time. He goes, just play it. There's nobody in the room. So I put my hands over by his on the piano and I played the intro to Hitchcock Railway, which uh, um, I had learned. And uh, we hear this voice from the dark. There was a couch in the dark, and it was Joe. We didn't know he was in the room. And he said, what was that? And Jeff said, oh, this is um, my friend Danny. Um, and Joe said, I thought I heard a ghost. And he meant um, the guy who played that part, who was at that point in time um, kind of off the radar. He had fallen through the cracks. Uh, but he was and is one of the most amazing rock and roll pianists ever. His name is Chris Stanton, original keyboard player from the Grease Band. Now he plays with uh, Eric Clapton and... Uh, Slumming it. Yeah, Chris's uh, <laughs> pantheon. Uh, and uh, was a bit of an idol of mine, so to hear Joe say, I thought I heard a ghost... Uh, was uh, quite a compliment, at least to my ears. Wow, that must have felt amazing. It was pretty cool, yeah, and yeah. at the same time, I didn't. F I felt like I was trespassing. And uh, Jeff said, "Well, Danny's real instrument is trumpet." And Joe said, "Do you travel light?" 
And I said, should I? And he said, let me introduce you to my manager. And he introduced me to a guy named Michael Lang, who was his manager, is also from Woodstock. Uh, and uh, we went into another room and got me, uh, I didn't have a passport, I didn't have anything. He got me uh, to an expediter to get a passport and I finished rehearsing with the band. By the end of the week, we went to Europe. Wow. And, and toured for seven months. Um, and I didn't play any piano on the gig except for Hitchcock Railway. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Jeff was sweet and let me play that. And I think Joe wanted me to. Wow. And wow. Uh, um, we were behind touring behind the uh, Unchained My Heart album uh, with the original recording band. Uh, and they added... Uh, trumpet and auxiliary keyboards which is what i did yeah those guys for seven months yeah and he, well, he was even during the periods of time when he was less popular in the states after the uh mid 70s he was thriving in europe platinum gold records and playing huge arenas and during that time which was 87 88 um George Michael and Michael Jackson were probably the two biggest concert attractions in yeah. the world. And Joe was playing the same halls in Europe. Oh. And then when he came back to the States, it would be more like uh, smaller places like Saratoga or Westbury Music Fair. So I didn't play in the States with them because they had to scale back to do the uh, 4,000 seaters. But in Europe, he was doing 10,000 seaters. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Never disappeared. He was always prominent in Europe, no matter what his career was doing in America. He was I never thought about that. Revered. Like, and I mean, it makes perfect sense. I just never thought about him playing small clubs. I, in my mind, it was always what you were doing in Europe. I didn't realize that it was as he, it was just less demand for it here. Or, yeah, and I mean, that still meant he was playing for three and four or five, 5,000 people a night. But yeah. to carry extra horns and extra keyboard players wasn't... Uh, you know, feasible. Yeah. So, and I, I always you. knew that when I signed on that when we got back to the States, uh, that that would be that.